Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 2021 uh, keynote speaker uh, for the Midwest Slavic Conference here in, yes, I am here at Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. Our speaker is not in Columbus, Ohio. Many of you are not uh, here either, but I want to invite you for next year, with any luck, the Midwest Slavic Association uh, in affiliation with the Center for Slavic East European and Eurasian Studies at Ohio State will again sponsor an in-person Midwest Slavic conference in about March of 2022. So put that on your calendar. All of you, those of you who are beaming in from, I don't know, California and uh, Kenosha and um, uh, Kinshasa or wherever else you happen to be, we would love to welcome you to Columbus. Um, I'm going to run through, I, I'm Angela Brittlinger, I'm the director of the Center for Slavic, in East, Slavic East European and Eurasian Studies. Uh, we've just changed our name to add Eurasian, which is why I am stumbling over it a little bit. It will be a slow rollout as these things go across all of our platforms, but eventually by next year we will be CS triple E S, uh, and we will again invite you to the conference. Um, I want to remind you of a few things. Uh, first of all, there's still time to register for tomorrow's events. I know that each of these, so tonight and uh, the plenary tomorrow and the other sessions, you can still register for the conference. Uh, you can still participate uh, in commenting on the blog uh, that we have been trying to run for tomorrow's individ individual papers. Um, and there will be Zoom sessions tomorrow afternoon for those individual papers for people to go into breakout rooms and talk about them. If you haven't started dipping into those, please do. Uh, the quality of papers this year is really amazing. Lots of them are great uh, presentations running from 10 to 20 and sometimes uh, slightly longer minutes. Uh, and so it's really fun to watch. I really recommend it. Uh, and there'll be some interactions tomorrow in the afternoon. And then of course, uh, on Saturday, we have actual Zoom panels that you can come to. So feel free to contact Alicia Baca to register still for the conference. Um, and uh, feel free to look at those blog discussions. Uh, we can only start, every, every blog discussion has to be started by an OSU person. So feel free to email me, brintlinger.3 at osu.edu or assistant director of the center, Eileen Kunkler at kunkler.10. Uh, and we will start whatever blog uh, discussion you want to get started or go ahead and comment on the ones that are already started. Uh, this is an odd uh, year, as we all know, uh, and it's an odd, odd time to try to have a conference, but it's really exciting to be able to welcome all of you um, and to be able to welcome our uh, keynote speaker, whom I will introduce in just a second. First, I want to remind you also that the Midwest Slavic Association has its annual meeting tomorrow afternoon, uh, and you can register for that and come to the meeting. I think it's at 515, if I'm not mistaken. There's also a student roundtable tomorrow afternoon, and on Saturday afternoon or evening, there is a student mixer. So feel free uh, to sign up for those and come. It's a great opportunity to meet people who share your interests, um, especially now when we're all stuck either in our offices uh, or home alone. All right, <laughs> so I am delighted to um, welcome our guest speaker today and I'm gonna take a little bit of time to do so. Um, I've known Yvonne Howell for many years and in fact, I hosted her on the Ohio State campus in about 2003 for a conference that we called Those Crazy Russians. For that reason, I could very easily make up the entire biographical sketch of our keynote speaker this evening. I certainly have plenty of amusing and incriminating stories to draw upon since we've had adventures together at conferences, not just in Columbus, but also in London and Lviv. However, I asked Yvonne to put together her own story in her own words, and I was again amazed and amused at what an exemplary Russian major she turned out to be. In the early 1980s, Ivan double majored in Russian and biology at Dartmouth College. From there, she went to Leningrad State University for a year of study abroad, what she terms a formative year. Even more true for Ivan, who has always been utterly fearless than it was for many of us who studied abroad because Ivan played the biology card and asked to be allowed to do her stagirovka in the zoology department of LGU. Uh, which she says was one of the very best decisions of her life. Instead of sitting around Soviet dormitories, wondering which of her acquaintances was a mole for the KGB, she was handed over to a bunch of Russian ornithologists. She spent her study abroad year studying Russia, 
developing her understanding of Russian language and culture while tromping through half frozen swamps with her ornithologist friends, tracking the migration of birds along the Finnish Gulf. The turn towards science fiction, specifically the work of the brothers Strugatsky, was motivated by her fascination with the culture of science in the late Soviet Union. The resulting book, Apocalyptic Realism, the Science Fiction of Arkady and Boris Strugatsky, had a significant effect on how English speakers have understood these essential writers, and it has now been translated into Russian as part of Academic Studies Press's wonderful Zapatnaya Rusistika series. Yvonne and her scholarship have returned to the banks of the Gulf of Finland. <laughs> English sci-fi lovers have treasured another book Ivan published, the collection Red Star Tales, which features Russian and Soviet science fiction from the entire 20th century, showcasing in translation the incredible importance of science fiction as a genre in Soviet times. If we haven't adopted it in Ohio State for our sci-fi course, we should. I'll look into it. Among other things, Yvonne was able to bring to a wider readership works that were obscure and or hard to find, and now they're available in English. The book is well worth exploring. And even I would wager, you know, giving to your favorite cousin uh, for the holidays. Very recently, uh, Yvonne has completed a brand new co-edited volume that reassesses our understanding of efforts to create a new man in early Soviet culture. We can keep an eye out for it since it should be published in a few months by Bloomsbury Press and it's co-edited with the marvelous science historian Nikolai Krimensov. Yvonne is a beloved teacher and mentor at the University of Richmond in Richmond, Virginia, where her colleagues and her students appreciate her incredible work ethic, irrepressible enthusiasm, and wry humor. She keeps it all together through the practice of yoga, and she is currently at work on a history of yoga in the Soviet Union. As far as the stories of how moments of happiness, Mamiantle Shastya came into being, that's basically the story she will tell in this presentation. Um, I could go on and on because I have three pages here of, uh, of Ivan CV. She did her PhD at the University of Michigan. She has repeatedly taken students to Prague and other places in the Czech Republic, uh, where she was an IREC scholar back in the Czechoslovakia days. Um, she is a phenomenal and fascinating scholar who, who takes that, that science part of science fiction really seriously, uh, which is what makes her uh, even more fun in Person. Please welcome Professor Yvonne Howell, the 2021 Midwest Lava Conference keynote speaker. And let me say one more thing. Uh, we're going to have Yvonne's talk. She'll share her screen. I'll disappear, but we'll come back. Uh, and Alicia Baca will give you a little um, primer on how we're going to run the Q&A after Yvonne is done with her talk. And we have plenty of time uh, to chat about Mamiante Shastya. Thank you, Yvonne. Okay, am I now, am I in the right place visibility wise? I think so, yes. Thank you so much for that introduction. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, I gotta say this is of course, feels a little bit like, I mean, it's kind of a daunting assignment. So not only does the keynote speaker have to speak right through dinner time, um, or if you're having a glass of wine, I mean, by all means, go ahead. Um, but now the whole thing's on Zoom. So I'll try my best to make this a little bit kind of like entertaining dinner theater. Um, and fortunately, the topic lends itself uh, to some interactive happiness. So um, I'm going to give you my first, I hope, here, um, visual um, of a little bit where we're going. And let me see, does that, I hope that looks like a slide, yes. So there's the cover of the book that's going to be that I've just translated that'll be kind of the topic of this of this speech or of this talk. Um, and the um, here's the original picture. I think it's pretty funny. She looks Russian. She looks happy. Um, and let me see. That will be, I think um, I'm going to stop the screen share for a moment and get on with the talk. So this book, Moments of Happiness, in its first um, kind of realization, it wasn't a book. 
um, Alex Dubas created Moments of Happiness as part of his radio show. It was at first an improvised oral exchange between a popular radio host and his traffic bound audience or listeners. The success of the Moments of Happiness format on air then led to a book version. The first edition of the book uh, included 900 entries of straight text, no pictures, no kind of framing devices, no names, almost no names attributed to the, to the entries. Um, and nevertheless, this book sold out seven times in four years. So it, um, it was really, it's been a very kind of, I don't know, it's hit a cultural nerve, I suppose. Um, meanwhile, Dubas also adapted Moments of Happiness for the stage and the resulting performance, which was billed, which was titled Quartiernik, um, was also a sold out hit. And I'll tell a little bit more about that theater performance later because that's the thing that kind of got me started or that inspired me to translate the book. And then finally, I'll wrap up this talk with a tentative thesis that emerged for me in the process of working on the English language adaptation of the book. As this supposedly, this was supposed to be my light, non-academic, kind of happiness-infused, fun little translation project. Um, but it moved forward pretty slowly from that initial um, moment when I was in the theater in 2014 and decided I would do it through like multiple delays that were all my fault up until the present moment. When the book is about to come out, the proofs are in press right now. Um, and a lot of things obviously have happened in Russia in that time and in the kind of global geopolitical zeitgeist in general. So I started to think more about the relationship between happiness or the pursuit of happiness as our American founding fathers called it um, and narratives of national identity. So now as I launch into a bit of storytelling, um, you can simply kind of sit back and eat your dinner and drink your wine and listen, um, and or in anticipation of maybe the final discussion, we can think about how a post-Soviet identity narrative centered on an individual's right to happiness, how this could possibly compete with the powerfully different tradition um, of, of kind of Russian Soviet identity narratives, which um, kind of one that Ushankin has labeled so evocatively as a patriotism of despair. Um, okay, so I'm going to give you a little taste of what these, these moments, these stories sound like. Um, and, and, you know, maybe, honestly, we all sense that the shadow of despair lurks pretty closely right behind our moments of happiness, uh, probably particularly after this year. Um, uh, but so we see that in some of the stories that are collected here. Here's one of them. And this story comes from a previous pandemic or near pandemic scare, the SARS epidemic back in 2008. So imagine you are um, Russian in St. Petersburg. You were due to give birth in an urban Russian hospital. You know, one of those tall fortresses of a building that are kind of like four buildings that face this interior a uh, courtyard down below, hidden from the street. Um, your family and friends can't visit. Um, safety precautions are in place. So here's, here's the first story. Here's one of the stories in the book. September 1st, 2004. I'm standing by a grimy window in the corridor of the birthing ward. I gave birth to my son during the night. In a few hours, they will bring him to me for his first breastfeeding. I can feel my legs buckling under me from exhaustion. So I grip onto the windowsill and look out the fourth floor window. Down below, I see a courtyard and a young man. He has come to find out about his wife who has the bed next to mine. They are both deaf. We're all under quarantine because of SARS. So they don't let anyone into the hospital. You can only speak to your relatives by phone. I'm wondering how my neighbor would be able to communicate with her husband when she wants him to drop things off for her and their new baby now that nobody can come in. Now I see she's standing at the other window and talking to her husband in sign language, signing through a closed window, separated by a glass pane and four stories. They stand there and converse with their hands for the longest time chatting about all kinds of things, 
Love knows no barriers. I smile at this thought and in that moment, I realized I was happy. So that's one of the stories. And now I feel like pulling out a completely different type of story um, and one that I remember in a very different context. Um, so yes, I should admit that, you know, aside from the yoga thing, I also like to do long distance sports. So there's a bike trail that stretches out of Richmond towards Williamsburg. Um, and in the summer, I'll often ride out on this trail all by myself. But sometimes it's nice to have, uh, you know, a companion for all those 30 or 40 miles. Um, and one time, a guy who turned out to be an ex-Marine, he started like riding alongside me. And I wasn't kind of completely sure, like, what, what were good topics to, to I, I kind of let him talk for a while to see what we were going to be talking about. And at some point he said he now worked as a scuba instructor and he was really excited about um, scuba diving or training people to scuba dive. I said, oh, well, that reminds me of a story I heard from a Russian drive diver. And um, here's that story as it is in, in the book. I think I was never as happy as I was in the summer of 1995 in those first few minutes. I am on vacation at grandma's house, the dacha in the country. I'm 13 years old. For the first time, I am wearing a mask to swim underwater. All at once, I discover an amazing, completely unknown world. Around me are fish, barnacles, seaweeds, and crabs, which I catch. I'm a little bit afraid, carefully reaching down to touch their pinchers. And the silence, that's what astounds me about being underwater, the absence of any sound. Now I am a professional diver. I dive into the depths of seas and oceans all over the world. But that first encounter with the underwater world, the magic of that encounter has stayed with me forever. So my Marine guy loved this story, which of course did not remotely fit his stereotype of what Russians do or what Russians are like. But after that, I was able to tell him all kinds of other things like why and when I spent so much time in the Soviet Union and the old Soviet Union, while he, who's kind of my age, was um, out there fighting proxy wars against the Soviet Union. So my initial impetus for translating Dubas's book was almost entirely based on the notion that it would provide a conversation piece that is accessible to anyone. I'm, I'm kind of hoping I'm gonna be like marketing this book in, you know, I don't know, for, uh, seniors in retirement homes who want to kind of come together and, and, and share stories, students in ESL classes, hospital gift shops, um, all kinds of things. Um, and Dubas himself, his own thesis about this project is that these spontaneously told individual narratives of happiness are simultaneously unique to each person's experience and somehow magically universal. Okay, so who is Alex Dubas? Alex Dubas was born in 1971 to Russian parents in the Soviet city of Kubyshev, which today is Samara, so big city on the Volga, on the Volga River. When he was about 12 years old, the family moved to Riga, the capital city of what was then the Soviet Socialist Republic of Latvia. Um, so the point is Dubas really came of age, right? He was a youth and came of age in the final years of the Soviet Union in, in the Baltics. So in this major Baltic city um, that I think, as you know, has rather different kind of sense of identity and of non-Russianness. Um, as he began his career as a journalist and then soon he moved into radio and TV um, in the 1990s. So, so Dubas began his career as a journalist and then as a kind of radio TV personality in the 1990s. Today, he holds both Latvian and Russian citizenship. He works, he lives and works in Moscow, but travels extensively. And over the last two decades, he has crafted a public persona that exemplifies, I would say, one end of a kind of post-Soviet identity spectrum. And that end is the purposely hybrid identity of a Latvian-Russian global citizen. 
Um, and I think I want to share screen again here. And let's see, there we go. Okay. So even a kind of cursory look at Dubas's publicized career profile. Um, in other words, if you Google him in and type Alex Dubas images, you get up, you get this stuff. Um, gives an indication of how he fashions himself into this kind of contemporary Russian. And, and also the degree to which I think he assumes his audience is our, our kind of like-minded compatriots. So this is someone who, you know, vacations in Switzerland, but not as a, but as an enlightened adventurer, not as a uber wealthy new Russian oligarch. That is not Dubas, right? But he kind of fashions himself as he's a kind of artist, middle class kind of guy, um, but who uh, maybe edits his manuscripts in a London pub or perhaps while visiting friends in France. This is someone who hosts a TV series on street food around the world. I think it's that picture up there. He's kind of almost like it has a kind of Anthony Bourdain vibe sometime. Um, he encourages his Russian viewers to appreciate the world's fine wines. He loves doing these food and travel shows. He's also though a very serious um, and charismatic stage performer who feels at home in any intellectual artistic milieu. Uh, where his lack of fluency in foreign languages is overcome really by an actor's talent for communicating across all borders. Um, let's see, next slide. Okay. Um, so if all of this sounds like simply living the good life, um, we have to remember that Dubas's career is a career built largely during the Putin era um, of sanctions and counter sanctions and so forth, and of increasingly striking efforts to reestablish a narrative of Russian national exceptionalism and exclusivity. So my first insight that kind of started to dawn on me, start, it might be formulated like this, Russian cultural production in the, in the last decade or so taking into account all kinds of popular media and entertainment, it's still a fairly diverse field, but it's safe to say that a divide is opening up between entertainers who cater to or cultivate the image of a workable global citizen model of contemporary Russian identity and those who cater to or cultivate a model of contemporary Russian identity that rejects globalization and emphasizes various interpretations of uh, of, I don't know what you might call defiantly Russian identity. And the interesting thing is how much this same divide, maybe we can talk about this in the Q and A, but how much the same divide is visible and opening up in pop popular culture in the United States. Um, the kind of American as world citizen or global citizen and these kind of increasingly maybe um, uh, strong kind of attempt to fashion something that's, or to defend a very exclusively American identity or model of identity. And I guess probably in both countries, the two polarities of identity fashioning tend to map onto that urban rural divide, not always, but to some degree. So moments of happiness never consciously addresses this divide. By default, most of the people who responded to Dubas's call for moments of happiness, um, submissions, right, were younger, urban, professional, politically liberal-leaning listeners of his popular radio show on Serebrini Dost, the Silver Rain radio show. Um, and yet, as we've moved into the third decade of this century, corresponding to, you know, Trump's presidency and Putin's extension of his own term for life, Dubas's seemingly apolitical ag agenda to make happiness part of a successful, normal Russian identity that it's actually starting to seem kind of edgy. Um, historically, as we know, Russian writers win Nobel prizes for illuminating the torturous intertwining of deep suffering and astonishing spiritual weightlifting. Um, it seems like this, this combination is the national brand. So Pasternak in 1957, Solzhenitsyn in 1971, Sakharov in 1975, and now Svetlana Alexievich uh, in 2015. Um, so a very, very um, 
a striking Russian tradition of uh, a culture that mines its kind of ability to suffer and overcome. How did Dubas decide to track in the opposite direction to insist that Russians should try to wallow in their own happiness for once? Um, okay, so why did I start this project or how did I stumble onto this project? The truth is in the mid 2010s, I imagined that I would find it fulfilling to write something that, had not, that, that did not involve putting my ideas into scholarly form. And I wanted to branch out and publish for something for a wider audience, but I honestly really had no idea how I was gonna do that. I didn't have much of a plan. And in fact, at this time, and it was in early 2014, I had scheduled a trip to Russia um, over spring break, which I think meant that here in Richmond, it was beautiful and in Russia, it was snowing and icy. Um, but I had some research project I was wrapping up and I decided to go then. And my first stop was to visit an old friend in Nizhny Novgorod. Um, my friend uh, works or was working as the Zam Director, um, uh, Zam Rector for uh, some division at the Vushka in Nizhny Novgorod. And the point is the you know poor woman came home every night totally exhausted and wanted nothing more than to kind of just eat, have a drink and watch TV. But in honor of my visit, she decided she'd go out and get tickets to the theater so that she and I would go out and actually do something. So the tickets she procured were to, were to something billed as a kvartirnik. Um, and let's see, I, here's my, where's our, here, the, it, this was the poster. She said, I have no idea what this is. And we were both kind of half afraid that it would turn out to be one of those like really interactive kind of avant-garde theater things where we'd show up at the theater and then we'd actually be whisked off to someone's apartment and then have to interact with embedded actors or something like that. But as it happens, it was um, an ordinary normal theater, um, pretty big. I think there were about 200 people there. It was completely full. And we sat near the front row watching the performance unfold on stage. And the stage was indeed set up to resemble a, a kind of an apartment, right? Like a normal apartment. So not an uber wealthy, ostentatious new Russian apartment, but not a like old Soviet intelligentsia hovel either. So it's, you know, sofa, lamp, coffee table with some snacks, guitar, bookshelf, that kind of thing. And during the performance, a few guests, sure enough, arrived to hang out on the sofa with the host. One of them even turned out to be a well-known singer-songwriter and she performed a song or two. Um, but all in all, the host, Alex Dubas, carried the show from beginning to end. And for almost two hours straight, no intermission, he interwove a story about how his book, Moments of Happiness, came into being with readings from the book itself. And all of this was embedded in an overarching monologue about finding individual happiness kind of along life's path. And his performance had the feigned spontaneity and tightly choreographed narrative arc of what we've gotten to used to, right? And stand-up comedians, really good stand-up comedians. And yet ultimately it was neither comic, although we laughed, nor sad, although we cried, um, it was an extended riff on what it means to be a post-Soviet, educated, urban, middle-class citizen in Russia today, still trying on modes and definitions of happiness that one is not ashamed of, that one can aspire to, and that hope one makes sense out of competing narratives about Russian national identity. Um, Okay, so the performance was mesmerizing. Um, it was at that moment that I decided this would be my popular book project. I would get the translation right somehow and translate Dubas's book into English. Now, the way Dubas tells the story of how the book came about is in fact, um, the, it's translated in the book. It's the preface to his book. So here are just a few little ex excerpts of, of that um, preface that I translated. So the author's preface. Moments of happiness is not a scientific study of the nature of happiness. 
That being said, I have a friend at the Bechtorov Institute of Brain Research who has studied the activity of endorphins for decades. And he claims this book serves nicely as a practical primer on how to stimulate those happiness hormones. So the book you were holding in your hands cannot exactly be categorized as meditation or self-help or science. What is it then? It's a book about us, by us, a book of our voices. You will hear these voices. And after you have read a few pages of moments, you will in fact start to feel happier. The effect is therapeutic. Try it right now. Open up to any page, read any one of these moments. In the meantime, I'll tell you about how Moments of Happiness was born. If I count up the total number of hours I have spent live on air, it would be the equivalent of two straight years without sleep. In other words, I, Alex Dubas, have seen and heard a lot, but only once have I broken down and cried in front of the microphone. This is what happened. One evening, our scheduled guest, a famous director, fell through. He got sick or he got stuck in Moscow's evening traffic. I don't remember which. Our program starts in one minute. I have to think up a new topic quickly. I have 30 seconds left. What will I talk about to our listeners? This is the peak traffic hour, the moment when about 1 million listeners in various cities tune in to hear their show. I have 10 seconds. Was there any actual news today? No, not really. Three seconds, two seconds, one. Здравствуйте. Как мы сегодня поживаем? Мы счастливы? Да? Нет? Probably not exactly yes or no. We need to talk about this. We need to talk about happiness. So let's do this right now, all you listeners out there. I encourage you to call in and describe a moment of life in which you were really happy. The next hour will be saturated with happiness. I began with a few moments from my own life to get the ball rolling. And then the listeners started to call in with their stories. That was the show that brought tears to my eyes and choked me up on air because the stories came out in real time, unfiltered reports from the field about authentic moments of happiness. I think it helped that I had asked for stories to be narrated in the present tense as if they were happening right now. That would allow everyone to feel as if they were reliving the moment, a kind of special effect. Okay, so um, he then that, so I'll, I'll end quote there. That is part of his um, preface where he describes how the whole thing started um, as, um, part of this radio show. Um, the stories kept coming and coming. We received, oh, sorry, this is still part of the quote. The, the stories kept coming and coming. We received, hun we received hundreds of texts. Everyone wanted to share the most important thing. And interestingly, although none of these stories, none of these stories of all the ones that came in, tell me about a moment of happiness. None of them were the like really obvious, you know, oh, and then the nurse brought in our little bundle of joy and, you know, later in my arms or that type of thing. Most often they were stories that at first glance could seem insignificant, ephemeral, arbitrary, but taken all together, they seem to make up a collective unconscious, some kind of enchantment. Um, Okay, so in this telling, let me see, do I have that quote? Thought I had it, no, okay. In this telling, moments of happiness came about because an experienced radio host in a moment of desperation and inspiration came up with a catchy idea that had genuine appeal. He received hundreds of responses and he compiled them into a book. He also created a theatrical performance that really worked based on the book. Um, now I should say the English translation, my adaptation translation, by me, we've been talking about this with Alex's you know, um, uh, explicit uh, approval, does not contain all 900 of the original entries. And it is in fact, lightly organized by theme. The original one isn't organized by any theme at all. It's just 900 stories. 
Um, and we decided to include some photographs. So this is the Petersburg photographs by the, the Petersburg artist, Alexander Petrosyan. So the book does include some cool pictures. We're kind of very proud to introduce the photography of Petrosyan. Um, and uh, yes. Okay, and here's the quote that maybe we'll hang on to most often. They, they were stories that at first glance seem in, in, insignificant, ephemeral, arbitrary. Taken all together, they seem to make up a collective unconscious, some kind of enchantment. Um, ultimately, the theater production is, and I'm getting to the kind of final part of the talk. Um, the theater production is very different than the book, or it has a very different effect. In fact, even reading selected moments from the book out loud is a better way to read the book, I think. Um, this much is acknowledged already in the original preface. The author says, don't pick up moments of happiness and try to read it cover to cover. Instead, dip around, find one or two at random and try them on for fit. Do you like some stories better than others? Why? because they resonate with your own experience or for some other reason. Um, okay, so I am going to read just a couple other stories. You heard the one about the woman in the Rodom with the, the signing um, neighbor and uh, the one about the, the guy that discovered the underworld, the wonders of the underworld world. Um, there's this one. It's a July night in 2013 in the desert. Badaram is the most beautiful desert in Jordan. I say to him, you know, in Russia, they believe that if you make a wish on a falling, on a falling star, that wish will come true. And we believe, he says to me, that on a magical night like this, when the stars are so close, God hears your prayers. He looks at me with eyes full of delight and adoration. I prayed for you and us, he says. At this moment, I am happy that this person is with me, that we meet in different parts of the world and explore different countries together. Sure, ahead of us lie plenty of obstacles, like convincing our parents that he's not Al-Qaeda and I'm not a Russian prostitute. But right now, there's just night, stars, a half-empty bottle of wine, and God listening to our prayers. Um... Another one, uh, let's see. My head is lying on the lap of a girl that I love. She is stroking my hair and saying, too bad you're not a man. I answer, if you can't change the situation, then you have to change your attitude towards the situation. She goes silent. I raise my head and kiss her. Ever since then, we are completely happy. Um, there's another very short one. Happiness can fall on you all of a sudden, like when your life, wife leaves for a trip and you walk around the apartment completely naked, helping yourself to jam right out of the jar with a big spoon and biting off chunks of a baguette to wash it down. So now I'm probably just making everyone hungry. I hope you all have something. Um, okay, and this, the last story I'll read, um, he includes several, uh, because many of his respondents at first were celebrities that were uh, guests on his radio show. He does include, um, let's see, I wanna share. Oh no, I think I've lost my, ah, there we are. He does include several um, kind of celebrity stories. Uh, many of my favorite ones are actually from theater people. But this one is um, Irina Halamada. I don't know how many of you are familiar with her. Um, I think she was nominated, one of the women nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize a few years ago, but um, a very interesting public figure in, in recent years in, in Russian life. Um, and the story from her is, I am walking down Bolshoi Mitrovka in the heart of Moscow, where the capital's gorgeous imperial architecture houses some of today's trendiest clubs. It's Saturday evening, people are partying, everyone is having a fantastic time, it's warm, it's dark, it's summertime, and then there's me all by myself. I had gotten out and started to walk, wanting to see Moscow by foot, not from the window of a chauffeured car. 
a bicyclist, a bicyclist comes up behind me. He can't see my face. So he says to my back, hey, want to ride? Uh, the boy is having fun. I turn around and say, sure, let's go. Then he sees who he's dealing with. You're kidding me. You'd be surprised on a night like this, anything can happen. But how will I take someone like you? Well, how did you think you would? So he ends up pedaling standing up so that I can sit on the seat. I have very long legs. I'll just insert that compliment to myself right here. So I had to keep my knees bent up the whole time. And he, the poor boy, had to pedal that bike with my 64 kilograms of weight on it. A warm evening, beautiful summer, people all around, this beautiful street, and I am riding, riding with my legs scrunched up along Bolshaya Dmitrovka. Happiness happened. So I am going to wrap this up by theorizing just a little bit this difference between the performed kind of dialogic narrative of these stories and the silent monologic, as it were, reading of the book. Roman Jakobson, because Kudajinam is Jakobson. Um, Roman Jakobson, as you probably all recall, talked about the difference between metaphorical and meta metonymic poles of communication. And in the first case, metaphor, right? The crucial element of meaning is created along what he calls the axis of similarity. So if you say your love is like a rose, I am jolted into seeing the unexpected similarity between those two things. And the power of communication is a function of what meaning is created when two things are held up in similarity. A metonym, on the other hand, creates meaning along what he called the axis of contiguity. So the White House is not a metaphor for the president. It's a kind of spatial extension of his body. It's a part. So the White House announced today um, that this or that or the other, or the sail, extension of boat, disappeared on the horizon. These are figures of speech that work because we recognize one element as an extension or a part of the other. Um, when these moments of happiness are voiced to an audience, as in the theater production, it's the metaphorical impulse that matters. You, when you're, as you're hearing it, you think, that could have been me. That's so similar to my experience, something I felt in a different place, maybe with different props, but that story is like mine. That emotion is like mine. And this experience along the axis of similarity is mostly emotional. It feels very emotional. Um, I think we have, oh, okay, that's. Um, when we read these moments silently, so to yourself, one after another, I think our minds start running along the axis of contiguity. We find ourselves thinking about how the reading of one moment kind of affects your reading of the next one. And in general, if you pick up a book of these like fairly recent contemporary first, pair, first person narrations of Russian moments of happiness, you can't help but start to think kind of along ethnographic lines. You, you start to kind of see patterns in, in, in the way people tell the story or the type of details that are um, invoked. So one thing I came to is the difference between the emotional kind of experience of these stories and the somewhat ethnographic reading of them. And um, these considerations bring me finally to some questions of genre and authorship and responsibility. And in fact, all the things I told Angela that I was originally really gonna focus on. Um, Right, so part of Dubas's book success may have to do with his generic agreement with the times. I think faction in general, self-reporting, documentary retellings, um, this kind of whole area of books and, and films and television experiences that, that are so dominant right now, where the kind of the line between fiction and faction and documentary and so forth is, is, is very blurry. This is very much a part of our times. Um, and these things all, these documentary fictions really beg some methodological questions, right? Where is the line between fact, fact and fiction? 
recording voices and arranging voices, um, between innocent storytelling and a kind of controlled narrative. Um, and honestly, at first, I meant to talk much more about these issues, and these are certainly things we can talk about in the, the Q&A. But um, something else has just come to the fore for me in these last several weeks um, or months, um, maybe particularly when we just witnessed Navalny, Putin's opposition nemesis, returning to Russia to make his final speech before being marched off to jail. Um, and I thought I would focus on this issue of, of, of kind of shifting narrative, uh, identity narrative instead. So here is, I don't know if you caught this, um, Navalny's, uh, the end of the speech that he made from the courthouse. Хотел бы, чтобы много других вещей случилось в нашей стране. Нужно бороться не только с тем, что Россия не свободна, а и по другим направлениям несчастна. Русскую литературу откройте. Um, одни описания несчастья и страдания. Россия должна быть счастливой. Россия будет счастливой. So, I was so struck by this, um, that... Navalny kind of ends up his, 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 you know, final words, as it were, that he knows are being recorded everywhere with a kind of a plea for, yes, we really, we need to be free. We need to finally be free, but we also need to be in some way. And I'm, I, I think this is, we can define happiness in millions of ways, but we need to, it's like starting to think about Russian, identity and the future of Russia in a way that includes the notion of happiness. Um, so identity narratives that work to cohere a sense of Russian community have always relied on a notion of suffering. Russians suffer and endure on a vaster scale than anybody else. Russian greatness lies in the alchemy that turns suffering into spiritual and scientific glory. In post-Soviet times, this identity paradigm has been theorized and formulated in so many different ways. I think I myself has, have called the kind of leap from dirt to glory science fictional. Um, Ushankin has used this term, the patriotism of despair. Alek Alexievich's books have of course reinforced um, that narrative of suffering. And like all authoritarian leaders, Putin has found various ways to co-opt and maybe manipulate the patriotism, deep patriotism really, that can be evoked of collective hardship and overcoming. And then along comes Dubas, one popular and perhaps even representative voice who is asking his Russian middle-class audience to imagine a pursuit of happiness that is both unique and Russian, but not at all unpatriotic. And with that, I end. Okay. And open it up for questions or discussion. I'm trying to come on to video to say hello and thank you for that. Um, I hope that we have a lot of uh, people who want to talk with you um and ask some questions and discuss some of these ideas i love that you end with navalny and i love his play with this idea of uh, right this idea of uh, unlucky right when we when we look at moments of happiness we have to remember always in english that this is not just happiness this is luck in russian and russia is in some ways, it's certainly from Navalny's point of view, it is a really unlucky country. Mm -hmm. um, and I too, uh, you know, I, I often joke, uh, when I suggested that we wanted to do this, this today and tomorrow's plenary about happiness, and it is a bit Russo-centric, but I expect to hear from people who are going to talk about other Slavic lands, I hope. Um, I, I was invoking a joke that my husband and I often uh, share that, um, when uh, 
when I'm worried about enrollments, he always says, well, just, you know, do a course called the Happy Russia Novel, and the reading list will be so short that <laughs> people will sign up for it in droves. And of course, I don't actually think that's true. I think that's a misunderstanding of Russian literature. Uh, but to have Navalny quoted that way, open up any book and you'll see misery and despair, um, is suggests that Russians also sometimes think that way about their literature, uh, the same way some of our students do. And you and I talked earlier about how Alexievich's books, which is an oddly similar, you know, arranging of ostensibly straight first person narratives. And that wins the Nobel Prize and gets the whole world's attention um, and stands in striking contrast, of course, not that this is this book is, 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 is kind of in contention for literary greatness whatsoever. That's not Dubas's point. He's, he's kind of a pop art, you know, he's a, how would you say, he's kind of like a inter, an artistic entrepreneur, I would say. Um, and yet still, the, the comparison is interesting. Well, he reminds me a lot of Yevgeny Grishkovets, yeah. actually, as a kind of an Estrada uh, performer, one-man show, uh, but who, for whom the pacing and the, the, the grins and the smiles are a big part of it. Yeah. Um, so, Alicia, maybe you could come on and give us your little spiel as to how we should do the Q&A, because I have a number of people in the audience I know who will want to do something other than listen to me and Ivan chat. <laughs> Perfect. All right, let me pull up my slides real quick. Eventually, here we go. Oh, oh my goodness. And I think I got it. Oh, Zoom was covering that up. Okay. Moment, oh, sorry. Zoom is being a little. Here we go. All right. Okay. Perfect. So thank you all again for joining us for the keynote address today. Um, so we are going to be taking questions for this, uh, for the Q&A se session of this, um, two different ways. So we'll be utilizing the Q&A feature and the chat feature, which should show up on your screen as seen here. Um, first off, the way that we will be using the raise hand feature. Um, oh, I think I might have said chat and not raise hand. I apologize for that. Um, so we'll be using the raise hand feature and the Q&A feature. Um, so for the raise hand feature, what you'll be able to do is you'll just, um, you'll click the little raise hand icon that you see at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we will do our best to get to everyone in, in the order that we see them. I apologize in advance if we accidentally skip over someone, if we happen to see someone earlier. Um, but once you click that and we allow you to talk, you will then be able to ask your question aloud. Please note that your screen will temporarily show up on the main Zoom screen temporarily. Um, but once you're done asking your question and it's been answered, we will mute, we will mute you again. <clears throat> and then the other way to ask questions, which I think most of us are fairly familiar with is using the Q&A feature. So once you click the Q&A icon, a little window should pop up in Zoom um, that has an empty space for you to type in your question. And it also allows you to ask questions anonymously if you'd like by uh, click or ticking off the little ask anonymously. Uh, checkbox at the lower left-hand corner of that new window. Um, once your question has been submitted, we will get to those in the order that they've been asked, and we will remove them from the Q and A as they as they are answered. And that's about it for the Q and A demo. Here we go. All right. All right, people, you've had the demo. Now it's your big. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that, uh, you know, I first was learned about this project in Lviv when we were on a conference panel together and I was a tad doubtful. Um, and it, precisely because of this whole nine, you know, 900 different voices uh, and the, the monumental effort of trying to organize them, because I, I recognize he didn't feel the need to, but that you would uh, feel the need to just for your English reader. Um, and I know we were going to talk a little bit, if, if nobody's going to ask questions, you can talk a little bit about the process of translation. Um, but, you know, the one of the things that I think is, is hard for some of us older folks to recognize is how important radio is and always has been for Russians uh, in the 20th and 21st century, but how important it is now. And those call-in shows and the idea of people sitting in traffic. Um, I've, uh, I used to listen to some, some long distance trucker radio, 
uh, in, in, from Russia, uh, which is very interesting because those really long distance truckers, they need to be entertained on the road. Um, ah, yeah, yeah. Stuff that happens there. Um, people, questions, anybody? Here we go. Okay, Tatiana, can we unmute her? Please go ahead. Добрый вечер. Добрый вечер. Иван, thank you for a really wonderful talk. I did not read the book, unfortunately, but you definitely made me want to read it in Russian along with the translation. So I have a couple of questions uh -huh. regarding, well, first of all, what is your favorite story of happiness? And I do wonder uh, which um, elements of translation stylistically did uh, you find the easiest and the hardest mm -hmm. 900 voices like I would imagine geographically and demographically they come from a variety of places and social ranks and ages so which nuances could you talk about and thank you in advance yeah that is a good question um as far as which is my favorite I I um that would be there, there's several, like I couldn't pick one. There are several ones for different reasons. Um, and that's hopefully the experience everyone would have with it. Some things really strike you. The ones I think for everyone, the ones that for some reason seem to be something that you share with that person who's a million miles away and how, you know, but there's certain ones that just personally, I, I could identify with what that daughter was thinking or what that mother was thinking or what, you know, certain ones. Um, other ones, I I just, there were many kind of ones coming from the actors or ones about nature that I just, I don't know, they were just inspiring. But the more interesting, but the question is, and it's a very good question, what were the kind of difficulties or not in translating all of this stuff, all of these different voices? And the answer is, this goes back to the problem of to what degree are these supposedly individual first person narrations uh, really that innocent? I mean, I Dubas himself, I mean, he he already set down certain guidelines. He said you have to narrate it in the first person, right? Use present tense. Um, it can't be very long. Uh, I, I think, and then he he edited them somehow. I mean, he has a pile of emails and texts and recorded sessions. And there's no way, I mean, that 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 he couldn't, that he didn't in some ways edit things. I mean, isn't this still the outstanding question with, with, with Alexievich's also method, right? What exactly is that method? I don't know, but it seems to me that this stuff is remarkably smoothed out. So when you read the book in Russian, I don't think you have the sense of enormous um, differences in voice, really. Um, I mean, I would say if anything, that may be a shortcoming. I felt like the theater performance um, really gave a much more vivid kind of emotional sense of listening to a lot of different people. In the book, I um, they were you can tell which ones came from young people a lot of them were rather young respondents, it seems to me. And then a few of them were clearly much older and recalling a very early, maybe much earlier time. But it was fairly, I want to, I, I think not a dramatic translation challenge in, in terms of voice. A lot of them are fairly, I don't know what the word is, simple maybe. So I, I just want to intervene. Carrie Hoke asks it, whether as a translator, you needed specific techniques to capture the many different voices in these stories. And are you saying no, that basically the voices actually sounded kind of similar? Yeah, I would say that they were all, since they had all been pre, um, I don't know what the word is, pre-flattened, if you will, pre, to, to be a, a, a kind of a present tense narrative. Um, there were some, of course, peculiar vocabulary issues. Um, the respondents were rather different. I remember noticing the difference between people that know how to tell a good story, whether because they are artists or because 
um, instinctively and people who are almost groping like for cliches, like, you know, like your aunt, whoever would, right? You can imagine that, right? The people who, who were really reaching inside genuinely to tell this moment that they were very happy about, but it's clear that they're not, they don't quite have the vocabulary beyond their Hallmark card vocabulary, right? Mm -hmm. So they're, that was a difference I noticed. And I mean, honestly, the, the people signed either not at all or with a first name and often with a location. And they were people writing from Tashkent and writing from Los Angeles, right? Uh, diaspora. And even so, um, I can't recall many instances where you had a sense of uh, very deep kind of stylistic or kind of dialectical register register that were different. Interesting. Okay, so we're gonna ask a question from Mary in a second, Mary Cavender. But first, let's. Uh, Ellen is gonna. Um, uh, Elena Sotarova is gonna unmute. Oh, hi. Yes, hi. can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay, so my question actually is in many ways related to what you were just talking about. But in my experience, um, I noticed the difference with the celebrities' voices. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. Uh, because in the preface, Dubas talked uh, about how it was a strategic choice not to, single, not to single them out, not to put those voices into a separate section. Yet those voices, like those stories get signed by first name and last name, and sometimes after a comma, the profession. Uh, like Valery Sutkin Piviets. Oh, oh, that's one of my favorite stories, by the way. That one is great. Right, but even before I got to the like to the la like to the uh, to the first name and last name, like before I would get to that part, I just by the style and by the length, I think those were maybe. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think they were maybe playing by different rules there, and I was wondering what you make of that because those were l longer stories and. They just really stood out in many ways. Oh that yeah, absolutely. Journey. Those were longer. They were more composed. Um, I think those were. I mean, they were. He reached out to them. Um, and they, he asked people that he wanted to hear their stories. Um, Zvanetsky. I mean, he reached out to people whose uh, famous people who he knew whose stories he wanted to hear. So yes, they were probably a lot. You know, or kind of got. I, I'm. I'm not sure if they got the impression they were allowed more length or if they were just. But my assumption was always also these are professional artists. I mean, they that that was I think that also came very uh, naturally to them that instinct to tell the story, like not just hmm, like to shape the story. I mean, I would if you asked me for a written submission of a moment mm -hmm. of happiness, it would not be the first thing I blabbed out of my mouth. I would. I would, I would write it down and shape it into a story, you know, just subtly, but with a beginning, a middle, and an end, and a really cool little, you know, I don't know, somehow um, twist in there somewhere. So I completely agree with you. When you're reading along, you pretty much know every time you hit one of those really well done stories. It's a little bit subtle, but it's absolutely noticeable. Yes. So did you cut any of those, or did you no. only cut the regular people? <laughs> I did not cut any of those. That's what I wondered. Okay, let's hear, Mary Cavender has a great question here. Would you like to address the relationship between popular culture, which at least in the Russian imperial period was more often, often more cheerful and highbrow art? It's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that would be still the case, right? That popular culture um, uh, is not ashamed of being more cheerful and kind of embraces being more cheerful. And, um, and highbrow culture maybe, uh, you know, still has a complex about, or, or kind of feels like that would be in some ways un, intellectual and serious, something like that. Yeah, that's a complicated question, but that my first uh, kind of impulse is to say that that, that division stands. Um, and uh, is, is perhaps something that maybe a little bit, some of these, uh, some of these personages who are a little bit straddling those two things, these kind of artist intellectual entertainers are maybe trying to push that 
line a little bit, finally. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's one reason why I never write a book, which goes, yes, even though I think he's interesting, because I have this kind of instinctive sense that, oh, well, it's not particularly serious. You know, it's not quite serious enough because it's, it's crowd pleasing. But let's, um, so we have a quick question here. Have there been any attempts to censor the book in Russia? No, uh, the book, no, but the entire TV show or the entire um, Serebrini Dosht, the media um, kind of notoriously liberal leaning media um, concern, right? That, that had the radio show and had branched out into television. Um, and right after the Crimea, um, Zahlatka, right, the Crimea thing, <laughs> um, which I think was rather openly criticized in the Serebrini Dosh channels or by some people, it was in fact, the whole TV thing was closed down, like from above. So the book itself, not censored, no, but the, the people involved in general, I think in, in kind of the circles that Dubas was working in and in that particular media outlet that he is identified with, um, they were kind of actually, in fact, reduced to, um, I don't know the exact details, but kind of very much curtailed to back to a single radio show. And um, where is he working now then? Is he on the radio anymore or no? I, yeah, he's also on the radio. He, he has, he seems to have a lot of different, you know, fingers in different pies. So he also has these, I think, very non-controversial, unless things get worse, this, it would still seem non-controversial to kind of, you know, uh, Anthony Bourdain it around the world, um, eating good food and interviewing locals and giving your little Russian commentary on local mores. Like he seems to really like doing that. He does, he's writing another play, but it's about something different, not about happiness at all. It's something actually, I think uh, much more, I think he's also, um, so yes, he has uh, several different concerns, not just radio, but also plays. And I think even hosts um, kind of, uh, what is it called? You know, uh, uh, when you can do a tour, um, a short-term tour of a city with a, with kind of where your guide is the actual, is, is Dubas or mm -hmm. other celebrity, that type of thing. Uh -huh. So Adam Wilson has a question. He says, thank you for a beautiful talk. He mentioned the intersection of the individual and universal in the moments of happiness shared in the book. I'm wondering if you could speak more to what might make Russian happiness distinctive from other recognizable forms of happiness in the West. Were there any accounts in the book that seemed particularly Russian? Yeah. Um, there's one very long one that comes to mind that is not by a celebrity. In fact, one of the longest ones, um, but it was from a, it's actually, I think a granddaughter saying, I am going to retell a story that my, my grandmother frequently told us. And then she kind of tried, she puts it in the grandmother's voice and it's this harrowing story of grandma at age six um, when Ukraine is under Nazi occupation. But as a six-year-old, she's focused on something completely different, right? And right, right, right. It finds it all very exciting that they've buried this pot of honey and then they find it or something like that. So that type of thing, of course, seems very mm, specific to a, a time and place. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think there were, uh, there is probably another theme, themes that I noticed a lot that maybe are more universal are the sudden, are those moments in nature when you suddenly feel as it were at one with nature. Mm -hmm. So that comes up several times. And that to me, I would classify as one of those universal ones um, that just that fairly often very ephemeral feeling, but you were just awestruck by some kind of encounter with where you suddenly feel yourself small in this vast nature. Mm -hmm. um, that was a, a, a familiar one. And then for the more specifically Russian ones, I thought, in fact, many of the actors are specific, that passion for theater. But again, I think that would probably translate across other, you know, actors realms. Um, maybe I forget who was our previous questioner who had read the book. Um, Alina. Or Eleanor? That might, um, uh, we probably also, if we think about it, we'll come up with some of them. Um, but, oh, oh, of course. There's almost a whole chapter, subgenre within the book of people that had grown up in the Soviet 
period for whom the moment of happiness that they pull out when they think of it is the first time they traveled abroad, the abroad that they had imagined and read about and that was alive to them as, you know, the Notre Dame of, of the, all the all the classical literature we were, the, the, the ballet dancer who had grown up, you know, dreaming of being a ballet dancer and having seen, you know, these, um, or, or read about the gondolas in Venice and all that. And then, unex you know, then overnight the Soviet Union collapses and, and these people who had never dreamed they would actually be there, the places they'd read about and invested with so much kind of cultural meaning. And then they were actually physical there, physically there, able to go to Europe, to all these places and not as kind of dumb pleasure seeking tourists but that first wave, right, as feeling like you were making your pilgrimage to the, the cultural um, Mecca. And that comes through super strongly in a lot of the stories. I have lots of questions, but also Jenny uh, Sundu has a question. She oh, has yes. her hand Jenny up. Here she comes. Forever. Yes. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Oh, cool. <laughs> Thanks so much for your talk. This was great. Um, I had a, a thought or a question. Um, and it sort of came to mind when you were reading out some of the stories. Um, someone who I think came to mind was Virginia Woolf and particularly like To the Lighthouse and The Waves um, where I think she managed to get, manages to get at a sort of like fragmentary, like collective, like not happiness, but sort of like moments of luminosity um, that it seemed like this was sort of perhaps moving towards. Um, and so I wondered if, uh, if, is there something about happiness in particular um, that requires it to be in this sort of like fragmented form? You know, like, <laughs> like it's moments of happiness, like not stories of happiness. And like that if you try to string it together and you have these like ups and downs that you could do that for a story of suffering, but you couldn't do that with a story of happiness without making it seem trite. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm just one. Yeah. So I was wondering about that. Yeah, I mean, on the one hand, absolutely happiness, I think, as we all know from personal experience, it's pretty ephemeral, but, but you're so right. I love that kind of, but the counterpoint is that the story of suffering, it, you know, it, 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 it can go on for hundreds of pages um, and not lose its power. Whereas evidently, you know, with happiness, that's certainly not the case. So I think that's that's an interesting observation. Yeah. But they are all, yes, necessarily, um, maybe almost by definition, it's this moment, right? Moment of happiness. Um, that's another thing maybe that was mm, kind of funny about, not funny really, about many of them, a surprising number the moment of happiness, the teller tells the story and then there's a little almost like follow-up. Like the last line is, of course, later it turned out that, and you know, <laughs> you viewed back through a, a recognition that everything went to hell afterwards, right? Mm -hmm. That also came up a lot, but. So yeah. it's that didn't yeah. happen though, the drop-off. So if that didn't happen, like the drop-off, do you think that 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 then wouldn't be, well, I guess it, yeah, by definition, then it wouldn't be a moment of happiness, right? Because then it's not a moment anymore if it doesn't end, theoretically. Well, I think in those kinds of stories, there was one I really liked, this woman talking, um, where, where someone really knows, they, they still recall and are able to tell the moment as something that was really wonderful, that you feel like they still draw energy from the happiness of that moment, even though it's then the last line is something like, and then later we got divorced and you know never saw each other again. But I remember mm -hmm. that moment. It was when, you know, whatever, in an earlier mm -hmm. phase of a relationship or in an earlier, uh, so the moment stays pure and then it's sometimes bracketed by, by kind of acknowledging these moments don't last. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you. What percentage would you say were childhood? I mean, I know you talked about, you know, eight-year-old and six-year-old. And... Oh, I started, those were some of the ones that I uh, did not, um, of the 900, <laughs> there were some that I was taking out. Uh, I developed a kind of a maybe dislike for a certain kind of um, early childhood 
yeah, almost a, I don't know. Some of them just seem this kind of, I feel hesitant to say this kind of on camera, it seems, I don't know what, but really these ones of, and I was little and daddy was big and strong and the master of everything, you know? And it just seemed like not just innocent, I, I don't know, there was something about it that just seemed maybe generic in a naive and uninteresting way. There was something about these very early childhood ones where most of the time, either what's, it, it's also very hazy. Most of the best stories, like any, as we know, as literature people, there's a very specific detail that's interesting. Um, and when those are lacking and it's this hazy sense of, yeah, I was little and so I felt safe and secure, those were not that interesting. Right. right. So, um, so Karen Petron is going to talk tomorrow uh, about World War II and happiness, which will be fun uh, during the plenary panel. But uh, she, a representation, let's call it, of uh, World War II. Um, but she wanted to ask if you would say a little bit more about the genre. In addition to Alexievich, are there other Russian or Soviet examples of a similar genre? Would we say anecdote or aphorisms? Um, you know, you and I had that conversation where I, I just find this, it's sort of interesting, you know, taking on other people's voices. And, and Alexievich talks about, and actually Litskaya talks about her work as being, um, uh, uh, no, not Litskaya, I'm sorry, Petrushevskaya talks about channeling other voices. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but but, but Alexievich talks about her uh, work as being this, you know, cycle of different voices. Mm -hmm. um, anybody else that you can think of, or any other type of genre that you could describe more? No, I've been more struck I, almost over here in our current moment of the number of uh, kind of quasi doc of documentaries that we've been somehow pop up constantly on on tv i think the pandemic has really fueled this need for everyone to and they're like they kind of present as somehow um you know more or less told through the person's voice and they'll the images they'll go back and you'll hear a voiceover and see the image of the person's mm -hmm. desk or what i don't know but it's like it's a little bit um deceptive isn't it like it gives you the sense of documentary this is what really happened and yet it's very much arranged and rearranged and could be understood in a very different way so mm, but in in russia right now i don't i i just don't know that much if i i haven't certainly haven't seen anything like like this book this one did strike i think a chord right it, it was surprisingly successful um and even like I said, and I guess I, whoever had read it, you know, can vouch for this. Uh, it, it, you open it up and man, it's just straight text. <laughs> it's just numbered one through 900. Um, and yet it's very usable if you just dip in and dip out. And it's definitely probably a good party book. You know, you just pull out, open the page at random and see who, who resonates with that one. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I almost feel like it's, you know, it could function as, you know, the kind of book you keep in your bathroom or, you know, like Reader's Digest used to be mm -hmm. uh, in the United States, where you, you dip into these stories of drama and then you go away and you do oh, your own life again. Right? I remember the one, the, I, This American Life, right, with Ira Glass. Right. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Although that's much more extended. Yeah. yeah. And it's not that he's so when you so that's another interesting question, if you don't mind, if nobody else is asking, um, how do you frame it? Because um, obviously you said you wanted to arrange them somewhat, uh, the, the oh, entries. Uh -huh. How did you arrange them? Because if you arrange them all, all the similar ones together, yes. then nobody's going to want to read it, okay. right? So what no, did here's, you do? here's the solution I came up with. To arrange them all about love, all about childhood, all about blah, that would be like, uh, that would make it, that would be really boring, right? So then though, when we hit upon uh, this photographer mm. and his photos are so quirky in a way, um, but very always he's capturing a moment. And of course, in his, in his mind, Petrosian, he's not capturing moments of happiness. That's not his goal. He's out capturing other, that's, he has his own agenda as a photographer. No. No. Um, we, I decided I'm gonna organize them with, there's a kind of a, for each 
roughly chapter, there's not even a title because I don't want to totally, I don't want to give away the, you know, in my mind, there's some connection, but um, there's a photograph that's very evocative of something. And we, I kind of organize them into six chapters, if you will, um, that each has a kind of almost visual light motif. Mm -hmm. um, and, but without telling readers what they're supposed to recognize in that mm -hmm. thing. So, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, but that's also interesting that, that something that started as a radio show and turned into a one man show then becomes uh needs that vivid saturated those photos are so saturated mm -hmm. you know, that vivid color um is really it's turned into it's this real like transmedial project like it's a radio show it's a book it's a theater production it now it has photos it's oh he even wants he wanted to i i don't know if he's still planning to do this but uh he wanted to kind of expand the franchise as it were and make a museum of happiness that would have these objects in it that go with stories. You know, Oprah did that. She did a museum of angels and it wasn't a great idea. I know, I, I, I haven't heard that it went anywhere. <laughs> I don't think it did, but it was, it just goes to show you there is this impulse to kind of keep moving across these media, you know, these boundaries. Well, and, and that's what I that's what I think that we can think about too. And it's gonna really lead us into tomorrow is that how is this connected to questions of nostalgia? And I really, I mean, I actually want uh, you know, a copy of your talk, because thinking about these ideas of Russian identity, what is Russian identity in the era of sanctions, in the era of closing in on itself a little bit, um, when you're not necessarily going to, you know, jet off to Paris, especially during the pandemic, uh, what, what is, what are those moments of happiness and how can, with how, what they tell us about Russia and being Russian. So I think we'll wrap up here. Thank you so much.